The original title for this was to jump into the Trinity in Hebrews, understanding God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit in the book of Hebrews. Uh, that was a little bit of an ambitious. Can you hear me in this one too, uh, Terry, if I'm walking around with this? I'm going to actually call in some of you folks, and I'm going to come hold the microphone up to you, because I'm going to ask you questions, and especially students I've had in the morning class, I'd like you to chime in and tell me answers. You guys are going to be put on the spot especially the student of the month over there, Melody. Okay, so here's the original title I had. This is what we've been studying in the morning class. And I realized that I wasn't going to be able to, to do all of this, so I decided to change the title to that. So we'll be studying some of Hebrews, and we'll be talking briefly about Hebrews. Um, maybe if Kevin lets me come back again one day, I'll, I'll do more. But let's jump into Hebrews, and why, why this book? Why is this such a, a worthy topic? It's because... The book of Hebrews shows how the Old Testament is proving Christ is the Messiah. And this is an, uh, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. And one scholar has said that if you were to look at the theological books of the Bible, Romans would probably come first in terms of uh, the heights that it reaches. But Hebrews would probably come second in terms of the influence and the power of its writing. No other book so eloquently defines Christ as the high priest superior to the Aaronic priesthood. He's the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. So the book of Hebrews is a powerful defense of Jesus as the Messiah. And uh, that's one reason I wanted to teach on this. The other reason, and uh, this is one of my favorite subjects, and uh, a good friend of mine who's visiting with his family, uh, is there's a sort of convergence of Jewish and Greek thought in this book. And the Jews and the Greeks were, had a lot of animosity or tension at the very least in Jesus' time, the Hebrew way of seeing things versus the Greek way was a constant tension. And uh, we see that, of course, the Jews and the Gentiles constantly seeming to uh, challenge one another. And yet the book of Hebrews seems to show how Jewish thought is being blended and reconciled or at least expressed in a way that Greeks could understand. This is part of what I want to share tonight. And so uh, a friend that's visiting, his name's Aaron, he actually knows Hebrew and he's a, a scholar and he knows so much of the Old Testament and the Hebrew there. Another friend that's visiting is Daniel, and uh, he knows a lot of the Greek philosophy. And so it's fun to have, even in my own life, people that know uh, the Bible in and out and can know the Hebrew, and others that can speak a philosophical language, and to see that God called certain people to speak to both groups and to show that his message could be expressed in a way that even the, the Greeks could understand. There's one challenge with Hebrews, though. One thing that makes it a little bit mysterious. Do you guys know what that is? What makes the book of Hebrews mysterious? Yes? We don't know who wrote it. That's a little bit of a mystery, isn't it? Uh, it's a book in the Bible, and we're not sure who wrote it. Does that, does that sound a little concerning? Do you ever read that? Well, let me just say this, that we definitely can see that the gospel is in the book of Hebrews, and it's a living gospel, and so from the very beginning, we could see that the Christians knew this to be in line with the other Gospels. But I still think it'd be worth doing a little study and saying, could we try to figure out who wrote the book of Hebrews? So I think that before plunging into Hebrews, I wanted to challenge us and say, can we figure this out? And um, I think, although 2,000 years of scholarship haven't proven it, I think we could do that this morning. I think uh, that's a slightly less ambitious task that I've taken on. So I want to hear if you guys have differing perspectives. I would love to hear it. Well, so we're going to go in a little investigation in this book of Hebrews and look at some clues that we've put together. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? What does the book itself tell us? Many people think it could be Paul. Paul is a, an amazing theological writer, but pro, Paul probably didn't write it. Why? It's because the, the style of Hebrews is so unlike all of his other writing. Um, I'll, I'll jump into the Greek in a moment, but Paul has a lot of ways that he writes and a lot of ways the Greek is phrased, and Hebrews is much different than that. So from the very beginning, people have questioned whether Paul wrote it. Paul always introduces himself at the beginning of his letters. He didn't uh, in, in Hebrews. And one, one strong argument why he didn't write it is in Hebrews 2.3, the author states that the gospel was confirmed to us by those who heard the Lord. Well, Paul always says, I heard from the Lord. Paul talks about his direct connection that no other man taught him the gospel. It was from God himself. So there's a couple uh, important reasons why Paul probably didn't write it. 
Some would suggest that he might have um, inspired or taught the person who did write it, too. So there's a lot to say on this. But if Paul didn't write it, we have to ask, who are some other good candidates? Well, it's been put forward that maybe Luke did. And Luke was gifted, and he, the force was strong with him, but uh, we're not sure that his writing style is exactly the same. There's a man named Clement of Rome. He's been put forward. Uh, Apollos, Priscilla, Aquila. These are some people that we meet in the book of Acts, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about some of these. Notice, does this have a laser pointer? Sweet. Priscilla, some people believe that uh, a, a woman wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, uh, a scholar named von Harnack, very famous scholar in the 1800s, he put this theory forward and said the reason that there's no introduction to Hebrews is she didn't want uh, her status as a woman to uh, ex- preclude people from reading it. That she wanted to be able to share the gospel and that she didn't want her being a woman to, to uh, influence people's perception of that. Very fascinating. I think I'm going to share who I think it was in just a moment. Before I do so, let's, let's uh, look at some of these clues here. Hebrews is written in an extremely high literary form. The Greek is outstanding. I mean, this, this Greek is classically composed, meaning it follows rhetoric and it's, it's organized in a very skilled manner. The vocabulary is so sophisticated, it has 150 Greek words that are nowhere else in the New Testament. In fact, 10 of the words seem to be unique to Hebrews. We don't see it in other Greek literature. So the person who wrote it had an enormous vocabulary, very highly trained in that. Uh, One scholar writes, the high rhetorical quality of Hebrews means that this is probably the most advanced education of anybody in the New Testament. Okay, so this is part of what I mean about the Greek and the Hebrew coming together in the book of Hebrews. Here's here's one passage that we're going to focus on in a moment. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Speaking of Jesus Christ as the radiance, the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. There's a lot of philosophical words there. That's very high, complex language. So if I just read that and you're kind of like, wait, what did that just say? I have to read that thing like three, four times to try to say what, what is he saying here. We're going to break part of that down in a moment and show this, this uh, powerful language that's being used. What, what other clues do we have? The, the person who wrote Hebrews, uh, he doesn't quote the Hebrew Old Testament. The Old Testament, of course, was written in Hebrew. But by the time of Jesus and his disciples, the Old Testament had been translated into Greek. That's the Septuagint. Can you guys raise your hand if you've heard of the Septuagint before? Okay, awesome. That's very good. Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Does anybody know where it was translated? Yes, it was Egypt. What city? Shout it out. Alexandria. Alexandria. That's correct. Alexandria is this beautiful um, city, one of my favorite cities. And we see that uh, they, Alexandria would take in this, this, uh, all these different languages and translate it here. We see the word Messiah, for example. That's a Hebrew word. Does that look right, Aaron? Is that correct spelling? Okay. A little punctuation marks. Messiah, Messiah, gets translated into Christos, Greek. This is an example of, of the process of um, Hebrew and Greek coming together in Alexandria. And so this, this city was a meeting place of the world. The, the great universities of the world weren't in Rome at this time. They were Alexandria. And of course, what is this wonder of the world here? Shout it out, Mr. Uh, Kevin. What's one of the wonders? There's going to be a library, but what's this wonder here? What is that? No. It's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The great lighthouse. That's correct. There's a massive lighthouse. uh, Enormous. And they don't know quite how they could have built it so high in the ancient world. But that symbolized this beacon of light to the world. Come to Alexandria, where this, this thought and this education was outstanding. And as Mr. Kevin mentioned, though, there was the great library as well. And so notice how this this theme of enlightenment is in Alexandria. It's believed they could have had up to a million scrolls. A scroll, uh, for you young people, was like an internet web page, but rolled up on papyrus. Uh, So picture a million web pages, like all of Wikipedia. And the great library of Alexandria. And uh, the Greeks wanted all the wisdom of the world, and so they took the Hebrew Old Testament and translated it into their Greek language, and this is where we have 
two traditions coming together. And this is an important theme that I really want um, us to think about, is the way God can communicate in different languages and in different ways of thinking. Here's a book that many of us may not know, and it's called, here's, well, here's me concluding that thought, Jewish and Greek thought are converging, the Old Testament's converging in Greek philosophy, and one of the best examples of that is a book called the Book of Wisdom, or the Wisdom of Solomon. Does anybody know what the Wisdom of Solomon is? Mr. Aaron, what is that? I, I'm just familiar with the writing. It's, uh, it's a, a Hebrew apocalyptic book. Okay. It's this, this book, obviously based on Solomon, that's writing um, a, in this fascinating language, connecting the Old Testament. This is written 100 years before Christ. It's not in our Bibles, although it is in the Catholic Bibles. We call that uh, the Apocrypha or Deuterocanonical. All that's to say is this, is that it, it has the flavor of Scripture, but for some reasons, uh, some traditions don't recognize us as Scripture. Whether or not we recognize it as Scripture is not super important right now, but what is important is that it's showing how Solomon, who's obviously a Hebrew, has been translated now, they're taking Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, translating that and adding their own Greek language to it. So look at this passage I, I took out. The bright beacon of wisdom... Okay, it's referring to God's wisdom like the book of uh, Proverbs does. That bright beacon of wisdom never burns dim. How readily seen by eyes that long for it. How open to their search. It's referring to this, this Greek mindset that craves the wisdom of God. And this is very symbolic of how two traditions, Hebrew and Greek, are coming together. I'm going to come back to this book of wisdom in a moment. But keep in mind, it's written 100 years before Christ in the city of Alexandria. All right, let's tie some of this together. What clues do we have? Who wrote this book of Hebrews? Well, because of its high rhetorical style, the way it uses the Septuagint it's from Alexandria, it's very likely that the author is an Alexandrian Jew, that he knows this tradition, combining the Greek and the Hebrew together. What do you guys think? Someone who's well-educated in Greek, sophisticated writing, he's probably from Alexandria, fluent in the Septuagint, uses the Old Testament to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. If we put all these clues together, we meditate on this. <laughs> Who could it be? Fluent in Greek? It could be John Moreland. Now, he's probably a young man at the time, because this was a while ago. But John knew the Greek, and he could write in such a manner. John, was it you? <laughs> was, it, was it you? No, maybe, maybe not John. I don't, I don't think he's from Alexandria. He's from... Oklahoma? Somewhere back there. Kansas, okay. That's far away from Alexandria. What do you guys think? Who do you think it could possibly be? Shout it out. Apollos. Apollos of Alexandria. I think it could be him. Apollos is mentioned in the book of Acts. It says, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, powerful in the scriptures. Eloquent here is the Greek word logios, which means more than just a good speaker. It means he knows the logos, the words, the, the writings. Logios in the Greek could mean a learned, a man of letters, skilled in literature, skilled in the arts, especially versed in history or antiquities. Apollos was very highly educated Jew from Alexandria. This would make sense that he wrote Hebrews because if you read this here, it says, this is Acts 18.27. Uh, before Paul came there, Apollos went to Ephesus, and it says here, he greatly helped those who through grace, good, good communion message today, by the way, helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Christ was Jesus. So Apollos is using the Old Testament in proving that Jesus is the Christ. Remember what we said that Hebrews successfully accomplishes? That's what the book of Hebrews is about. It's using the Old Testament to show that Jesus is the Christ. No other book so eloquently defines Christ as the high priest, superior to the Aaronic priesthood, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. That's what Hebrews does. That's what Apollos did in Acts. So he's well-educated in Greek, a sophisticated writer, He's from Alexandria, knows the Septuagint fluently, and he's going to use that Old Testament to prove that uh, Jesus is Messiah. Okay, so maybe it is him. 
obviously, I, I don't, it's not proven, um, but why? Why is it important that we make a conjecture like that? Because I think it helps us understand what the book of Hebrews is doing. Um, if Apollos of Alexandria, or at least somebody who wrote this, is from this tradition of Alexandria, the book of Hebrews suddenly makes a lot more sense of what's happening here. This great tradition of literature and philosophy is used now to explain to the Gentiles what a Messiah is. So in Hebrews 1.3, when I pick this verse as a sort of perfect expression of that, let's go through this uh, slowly together and try to meditate on what this is actually saying. How this represents this high level of thought and based in the Bible. Jesus Christ is the radiance of of the glory of God. He's the exact imprint of God's nature. And that word nature means essence, like the substance of who God is. That, God is, that Jesus is the exact copy of that. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So if I could focus on just one word, it's radiance here. And to me, this, this ties a lot of the themes together. Radiance. Christ is the radiance of God, the glory of God. The Greek word for radiance is apogausma, apogausma. And this word only appears one time in the whole New Testament. This is the only time we ever see this word in the New Testament. This word means the reflected splendor, the light which emanates from a luminous body. So, of course, the visible sun is just an example of that. That's just an analogy. But picture how the author is saying, you know how you see sunlight shining down? That's what Christ is like. He's like God with us. It's the sunshine shining down on us. The rays or beams of the sun are its brightness, or that by which the sun is seen and known. For those of you that have been studying the Trinity in the morning class, do you guys remember this analogy now? I know, remember Melanie does. She remembers the tree and the spring. The sun was one of the analogies of the Trinity because we can talk about God the Father as the sun and Jesus Christ as the apogalsma, the ray that, that is sent forth. For God so loved the world, he sends his son. The sun right there is sending out its rays. What's so cool, and I, I took this clip art picture of a sun. This is a clip art picture of the sun. And notice those triangles, those rays, are part of the sun. It's included in that image. Those are inseparable. You do not have the sun without its light. You do not have God without his glory, his brightness. And so this is one peek at how the Greeks translated the Hebrew scriptures so they could understand who God is and who his son Jesus Christ is. And it's philosophical. It's philosophical. They're using an analogy of light, an analogy of, of, of sunlight to explain who God is and who Jesus Christ is. I hope that, can, that sinks in. I've been thinking about this actual analogy for many, many moons. Um, this is a fascinating thought. It is just an analogy, but it's through the light of the sun that we can actually see the sun. If you have seen the sun, then you've seen the Father. Well, I'm going to try to be punctual, actually, and wrap up in a moment or two, but here's, here's a, a fascinating, I think, connection that might surprise some of you. Hebrews 1.3 that we just read Jesus Christ is the radiance of the glory of God. Why did I make such a big deal about connecting this to Alexandria, the Alexandrian tradition of, of that enlightened culture? Well, I, I referenced that book of wisdom um, that was written there, that book of wisdom that took the, the wisdom of Solomon from the Proverbs and took some Greek philosophy and tried to speak it in a new way. This passage is from the book of wisdom, written 100 years before Christ. The book of wisdom Chapter 7, verse 26. For she, that's the, the Greeks would always call wisdom she because it's the word Sophia, which is a feminine word. She is the radiance, apogosma, same exact word, of the everlasting light, the unspotted mirror of the power of God, and the image of his goodness. So whoever wrote the book of wisdom looked at Proverbs, new Greek philosophy, or Greek language, and, and wrote this a hundred years before Hebrews was written. That the wisdom of God, God's wisdom is his radiance. Jesus Christ is the word of God. This is the wisdom of God. What's the point? Is that maybe that there's this way that he, uh, the author of Hebrews knew how to speak to the Greeks. That they already knew this. 
So he goes, no, it's Christ is the radiance of God. Like, oh, okay, yeah, just like how we were learning the wisdom was, now we can understand that Christ is this light of God. It would make sense to them. They could understand it. They could receive it. God uses certain people, I think, to speak in a way that others can receive that. And I think that's a unique uh, calling that some people have. They can speak different languages. Not just linguistic languages like Hebrew and Greek, but they can speak languages of philosophy or of art or of culture. I think all of us are gifted in certain languages. Tommy knows physical workout language. He knows, <laughs> he, we know sports and biology. These are all languages. What language are you gifted in? Because God wants to use your language for you to speak out to people. Whoever wrote Hebrews was gifted in philosophy. I assure you of that. I've studied it enough to know he knows what he's talking about. And he can use that to speak to the people in Alexandria and to the whole Gentile world, just like Paul did. Maybe it is Paul, by the way. Paul's pretty brilliant. This was really meaningful to me because I, this is part of what I think my calling in life is, and I appreciate the words of Kevin. I like academic and scholarship, so I hope that you guys uh, appreciated some of the academics here. And so to wrap up, I think the Alexandrian tradition represents something that's ongoing, it's alive, it's living today. That this Alexandrian tradition is where the Septuagint came about, where Old Testament is meaning that Greek. The book of wisdom that I just quoted from was written there. The book of Hebrews seems to be from the Alexandrian tradition. Do you guys know the very first theological school of Christianity was in Alexandria? First more formal school. And a lot of my heroes come from this school. I did my master's thesis on Eusebius of Caesarea, who came from this school in the uh, Roman times. This school of Christendom had a, a mission, a purpose. It wants to stand, uh, use philosophy to try to prove that God is true, because all truth points to God. And they said, we're going to help understand theology by using uh, this philosophical truth. So they used this tradition to defeat heresies such as Gnosticism, overcome paganism, and bring the light to people in the ancient world. And uh, I guess I want to wrap up by saying that this is really my heart. And you guys know that the school that meets here, Boise Classical Academy, is kind of following a similar tradition where we want to be firmly rooted in the Bible, but we're also able to, to shape their minds with reason and, uh, and philosophy. Not that the Bible doesn't have reason and philosophy, but show how these things come together. All truth points to God. We want to enlighten them and make them powerful like Apollos was. He says, a man eloquent and powerful in the scriptures, that he could speak to Jews and to Greeks about the living word of God. Well, I'm going to wrap up now. Um, I, that was only scratching the surface. There was so much more that we, uh, we could get into, but I, I really thank you for the opportunity to do this, and uh, I really enjoyed sharing part of my heart and what I just love. And when I do a Bible study, it's, I love digging into it and seeing what's the history behind this. Let's, let's solve a mystery. So maybe, maybe Apollos didn't do it, but it's a fun thought to think about uh, this beautiful city of Alexandria and the, the tradition The, the way that God spoke to people there, too. I'm going to wrap up in prayer. Afterwards, if you guys want to come talk to me about this, if you have questions, I'm going to hang around for a little bit, and I'd love to chat with you folks. Let's go to God in, in prayer and just um, with a heart full of gratitude and praise. Lord, we thank you, God, that, that we can come together in fellowship and just look at the way that you speak to us, God, and we all have different ways that we communicate, different ways that we think, perhaps. Some people could be visual learners, and some, uh, they, they like to work with their hands. And Lord, you made us that way. You made us unique and with such variety. So Lord, I pray that we can come to you as our Father um, in the ways that you speak to us, God, and that all truth points to you. Lord, we, we do Bible studies to firmly plant ourselves in the truth that you've revealed through the prophets, through revelation, God. And it's amazing how... It all lines up together. It all fits together. I ask you, God, that you can use people in this congregation, Lord. You can use them powerfully, just as you use Apollos and Paul. Use them powerfully, God, to share your word, share the gospel. And like St. Francis said, sometimes you must go and preach the gospel, but only use words if necessary, meaning maybe we, we do it through acts of love. Maybe it's helping with the leaves that we heard about. Um, but God... Teach us your own language, the language of the Spirit, that sometimes 
utters and groans, God, that can't be translated. Uh, these deep groans within us, God, that is the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you empower us and that we can help transform people's lives. And Lord, we pray this um, in the name of Jesus, by your grace. Amen.